it's Kendra here from Circle J. Today we're going to talk about harnessing the miniature horse. We're going to start by talking about the back saddle because that is the first piece of harness that you put on. It's the largest piece and it's also the, the structure that holds the whole harness together. I have here three quite different back saddles. So you can talk about, we're going to talk about what makes them comfortable and functional for the horse. Uh, these ones are going to be used for different things, so we'll talk about that as well. Uh, this, we're going to start with this one. Uh, this is a marathon harness. It's made for combined driving. And when we talk about comfortable and functional, this would be the gold standard for those two things. Um, it's a synthetic harness, which means it's easy to clean. It's not leather except for the lining. Um, easy to clean doesn't mean I have, as you can see. Oops. <laughs> what you can see about this that makes it so comfortable for the horse is it's quite wide so that the load, any, any weight that is on their back is spread out. Um, it's got lots of padding and you can see it's got quite wide gullet space. We talk about gullet space a lot when we talk about riding saddles. It's a really important consideration. You see those horses that have uh, white marks on their withers from, from a harness or from a saddle generally, but it can happen from a harness saddle as well. The horses have uh, dorsal spinous processes on the vertebrae in their withers. They stick up like fingers, these bones. And, so, and there's not a lot between those bones and the skin on their withers. So any sort of pressure on those dorsal, spin dorsal spinous processes, say that three times fast, um, those can cause quite a bit of discomfort for the horse. Worst case scenario, you're going to get galls. Um, you could even cause... Uh, kissing spine syndrome, if you guys want to Google that one, <laughs> because the horse travels hollow and those, those dorsal spinous processes touch together. So what we want to do is allow the horse to round their back uh, in order to move most effectively. Round their back, reach under themselves with their hind legs, that's how you're going to get them to elevate their front end and get that really pretty movement that you're looking for. The other thing this, this harness has is it's got a solid tree. So this is a really stable uh, harness saddle. The other extreme here, for a completely different job, we have a show harness. This is a fine harness. Uh, you can see it's very narrow, again, because it's supposed to be fancy and pretty, right? Very narrow, it's got no gullet space whatsoever, and it, it really doesn't have any padding either. But it's also made specifically to drive around on a groomed show ring. So it isn't like this is, just don't use, if you don't use this harness to bomb through the fields, and do a marathon, <laughs> you're probably fine. But we do want to be even more careful with our placement of a harness like this. And we'll talk about putting it on the horse in just a minute. Uh, the other thing, this harness doesn't have a solid tree. This, well, it's pretty solid, but not very, not entirely solid. So it will bend a little bit. Not a big deal. Like I say, it, it's, it, it's the right harness for the job that you're doing if all you do with it is drive in the show ring. You can see we do have, we did make a little pad for this one in order to make it a little bit more comfortable for our horses. Finally, this is a sort of in between those two extremes. And this is my favorite harness. This is the one that I use all the time. And it is a show harness, it's patent, but you can see it's a medium width. So it's still got enough width to be comfortable for the horse while not being as overwhelmingly wide as this one is. It's um, got some padding. It doesn't have a solid tree. I'd love it if it did. And it doesn't have gullet space again. I prefer that it did, but um, I've yet to find a harness saddle that I really, really like. <laughs> so this is what I'm using for now, as you can see with a big pad, because I know what its, it's um, downfalls are, and I wanna try to make it as comfortable for my horse as possible. While we're talking about the harness saddle, we also can talk about the different options of tugs, and these three harnesses all have different tugs. The tugs is the shaft loop, where the shafts sit while you're driving your horse. This harness has open tugs. That means that this the shaft goes through here and it just floats in that, in that ring. Um, now, big horse people believe that that is absolutely the very best option. They say with a two-wheeled carriage, you want those shafts to go through there and float along so that they don't, uh, well-balanced two-wheeled carriage, so that they don't um, transfer every little vibration to the horse's back, which is really good logic. However, in my experience with miniature horses, an open tug like this means that you can get a lot more momentum on those shafts, and instead of getting a tiny vibration like you would in the other methods, 
um, you get a big wha-bam as that car, cart goes over a bump. I, yeah, in my experience, this isn't my preference. That's why the harness is so dirty. I, <laughs> I use it only as a surf single, a lunging surf single. So I, again, play with it. That's the logic behind them. So maybe, maybe it'll be right for you, but to, to, that's, that's how they work. You can see they've got a buckle at the bottom, goes down to the overgrowth to keep it from flipping right up. Um, the other thing that's really important to know about open tugs is if you have a harness with open tugs, you can never ever use it without breaching. So you must use breaching if you have open tugs on your harness. And we'll, we'll talk about that more as we hook them up to the cart. The show harness here, the fine harness, it has what are called French tugs. So French tugs go around the shaft and they tighten down. So you have this loop here, when you pull on this, it tightens around the shaft to see, give it a little bit more stability. Then you put it through the ring here and buckle it down to the overgirth. This is pretty common in miniature horse show harnesses. It's a pretty common option. So it, that's how, how they work. Um, again, if you're driving in the show ring with this harness, it's probably okay to use it without breaching. If you're gonna do anything other than, again, drive on a groomed arena, I would suggest with French tugs that you add a breaching, but again, it's up to you. It's not completely unsafe to use your uh, French tugs without breaching. You can see we have breaching on this harness at the moment. And then this is my favorite option. And this is one, when I bought this show harness, I had to specially request <laughs> that I wanted wrap straps. I much prefer wrap straps for the stability that they give you. Particularly if you are planning to drive without breaching in the show ring, uh, because this, the, then this is all that's care holding everything in place is these wrap straps. So I think it's really important. Um, we'll talk about how to do these wrap straps as we hook them up to the cart, because it'll make a lot more sense with the shaft in, the, in here. But what you do is you put the shaft through the loop and then you wrap in front of and behind in order to hold the shafts down and in place. Now, as, as we're talking about putting this on the horse, um, one of the things that is really, really common, a common mistake, and I'm not saying just in miniature horses, every single driving clinic I've ever gone to, the instructor has corrected this on someone's harness on any size of horse. We need to make sure that we don't put the harness saddle too far forward. Uh, people always try to put them like a um, saddle, where you sit it on the withers, slide it back a tiny bit, collar good. You're right up on the withers. That's not the case with this. We need to be behind the withers. Um, chances are, wherever you think is far enough back, put it a little further back. <laughs> so we're going to put this on Rocky here. Okay, so as we put this harness on Rocky, we want to make sure that we're setting it right back about here on his back. And if you can see that. We want to make sure that it's not way up here at the end of his mane. That would be incorrect. We want to put it back here a little ways. And the reason for that Number one is it, it saves the, the, the highest of those spinous processes. We put it behind his withers. As well, we want to make sure that we, his, his uh, shoulder blade is not interfered with, which goes way back to here. And I think most obviously to most uh, of our horses, we want to make sure that when we do up the belly band, when we're not standing on the rock, rock straps rock, <laughs> we want to make sure that it doesn't interfere with his elbow. Now, on some of our horses, and I, I include me, myself in that. Step up, please, Rock. Step up, please, Rock. Thank you. Um, I, I include myself in that. But in some of our horses, our harnesses maybe are a little bit snug on them. <laughs> it's not the case for Rock here, but in many cases. And that, that, uh, that belly band, that girth, slides forward to behind their, their front legs. So we need to make sure that it's not too tight <laughs> so that it will sit back there. Because then other, every time he takes a step with this front leg, every time it goes back, it's going to bind at the elbow. And you'll get rubs and galls and pinches there. So we want to make it as comfortable for him to use his limbs as possible. So we need to keep it further back like that. Now, it doesn't need to be tight. We're not putting a saddle, cinching on a western saddle that we're going to haul or have to be able to haul ourselves up in the middle of the pasture somewhere. It just needs to be snug enough to sustain the whole system. Too tight is actually going to be really bad. It's going to interfere with his ability to breathe. It's going to be like wearing a really tight belt while working really hard. It's not going to be effective. It's not going to be comfortable for him. Uh, next, we're going to put it on the crouper. Um, I didn't talk about croupers on the 
on the harnesses, but Coopers are pretty much universal. Just make sure that they have a reasonable amount of padding and not a too obvious seam and monitor that they don't get any rubs from them. Now before we even put this Cooper around his little bum, we can look and see if it's approximately the right length. Now I can tell already, I know it's probably hard to tell on the video because he's quite hairy, but it's January, what are you going to do? Um, <laughs> it's going to be way too, because there's the top of his dock right there, so it's going to be way too long. So I'm going to go ahead and shorten the back strap right off the bat. There, that's a little bit better, we can see. So when we put the crouper on, you want to make sure that it's not got any hair in it, and that it's about half an inch of droop below the dock, maybe an inch, half an inch to an inch. Look at all this fur. <laughs> so we, we want to make sure that it's not tight. We don't want it to be pulling his tail up. It just needs to be there again to hold everything in place. And some of these fitting things, you're not actually going to know how well they fit until you are driving the horse. If you see that back strap start to slip sideways, probably your creeper's a little too loose. And sometimes why the horse ones who really, really used his hind end. He could just reach under and power. We had to make sure that his, his back strap was a little bit looser than it should be when he was standing still so that he had room to reach under and really tuck that hind end and lift. So, which was a really good thing. We didn't want to discourage that by a tight crouper. So again, some of these things you can't really be absolutely sure that it's fitted properly. So get in the cart and drive this foot with them. And then other things you can't tell unless you've got somebody standing back while you're driving them saying, hmm, I think maybe that breast collar could go up a half an inch. Let's try it like that. So it's something you can play with. Now, breaching. We might as well talk about breaching while we're at that stage. Now, breaching is your horse's brakes. You can see it goes around his hip here. This one's not too bad. It could maybe come up a tiny bit, but it's pretty well fitted to him. We want to make sure that we use breaching any time that we're doing up and down hills. It's really important. We want to make sure that our, bre our breaching is well fitted. Um, it doesn't go too high and goose him or too low and take his hind legs out from under him. That would be a very, very bad thing. We want our breaching because it really stabilizes everything. I started every horse in breaching because as they're young and learning to use a cart, um, it really stabilizes, keeps the cart from running up on them, from jamming them. When you only have the wrap straps to stabilize everything, it, it, it just isn't as smooth for the horse. Um, and you absolutely, it's quite a common misconception that you're not allowed to use breaching in the show ring. And that's not true at all. You can absolutely use your breaching in the show ring. And if that's what your horse is comfortable with, I highly recommend that you do. The only times I might not, um, I would hesitate in a single pleasure driving class and I probably wouldn't in Roadster. But otherwise, uh, use your breaching. And if you want to, if your horse is more comfortable with it, use it in Roadster class. You're, it's not against the rules at all. In a classic or Western, I think it's absolutely appropriate. Uh, last time I drove Image, it was my old driving horse um, at Stampede, he was, I drove him in the warm up and it was the brand new arena in the new Agrium event center. And it was, the draft horses had been there and it was a little, Hilly in there and things just weren't that stable and he was having trouble finding his big float with that cart you know running up on him a tiny bit and it's not much I mean he, his wrap straps were done correctly everything was done right it was very little but I could tell that he wasn't completely comfortable after the warm-up I went back to the barn I put his breaching on he went in the ring and he won reserve Canadian National Classic Pleasure Driving Horse because he was able to find that float he was way more comfortable with his breaching on so I, I don't think it's something that we, those of us that show horses need to dismiss out of hand because I think it's a very valuable tool and it's something that horses uh, feel very comfortable with. A lot of combined driving, carriage driving types think that it's absolutely wrong to ever drive a horse without breaching because it is their horse's brakes and they have a very valid point. Um, when you're looking at actually putting on a, a finding breaching for your horse, we want to make sure that it, two straps is better than one, holds it in place better. You can see he's got two straps. And we want the, the loop at the end of the breaching to go from flank to flank on each side. And that's how you know it's long enough for your horse. Uh, these are the holdbacks. 
and we'll talk about how to attach them to the cart when we get to that point. So there's the basic structure of our harness. Next we'll talk about the breast collar. As you can see, we have three very different types of breast collars here. And they're from three different harnesses for three different purposes. A breast collar, in general, has a strap that goes across the horse's chest, like the name suggests, <laughs> and a one that goes over the neck to stabilize it in place. And then they have traces that go back to the single tree on the cart. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we hook him up to the cart. Oh, sorry, Rock. So our first uh, breast collar, let's start with the one of uh, the finest. So this is from the fine harness. And you can see it's very, very fine. Very, very narrow breast collar. When we're fitting a breast collar, we need to make sure that it goes above the point of the shoulder and below the base of the neck. And with miniature horses, sometimes that's a bit of a concern because they have necks that tie in quite low and they don't have space. If you look at a Frisian whose neck comes straight up, and they've got this, like, this much chest in between, so it's not hard to get the breast collar in a space that's going to be really comfortable for him, not interfere with his movement or with the comfort of his windpipe. It's not actually going to cut off his windpipe because it's way back in there, but we want it to be comfortable for him. Um, the horse pulls the cart by pushing on the breast collar, so we need to make sure that, that it's in the right place to be most comfortable for him. A narrow one like this is probably going to be pretty easy to find the right place to put it. However, it also, as he's pulling the whole load, pushing that whole load with the breast collar, it's not a very wide, comfortable area for him to do it on. Once again, this is a show harness. It's made for him to pull a cart on a groomed arena. So it doesn't need to be super padded for that short time, easy load. This one, again, will go extremes. I love this breast collar. This one was custom made for me and it is fit every horse. I've put it on beautifully. Now, this is for a different job, right? This is for a horse that's going to be working hard, pulling a heavy load, going up and down hills. It has, uh, it's a deep V breast collar. So it's wide and padded, so he has a lot of space to spread out that load of pulling the carriage. And it's a V shape, so that it, it makes it way easier to put it on a, a low, a horse whose neck ties in low because he's got lots of space here for his, uh, his neck to come out, the base of his neck, and it goes high over the points of his shoulder to allow him the freedom of movement with his shoulder while he's still pulling that load. So it, it's also got a wider neck strap, again, just to hold everything in place more comfortably, and there's more weight to this, right? So it needs to be a little bit, have a little bit sturdier uh, neck strap. This one also has loops for the reins so that they can go from the, from the bit through the neck strap turrets through the turrets on the saddle and then to the driver's hands, which keeps everything a little bit better in line. And if you've ever had a horse that hooks his, uh, his rein on the front of the shaft, it's a scary moment. So this will help prevent that. And then we have the middle of the road one. So this one, it, it's wider, so it's more comfortable for the horse, but it's still patent. It's still a little bit finer. So when I drive, this is the, I, oops, sorry, Clara. I use this harness, or this breast collar at home all the time, driving out in the field. But when I go to, into the show ring, I usually switch to this one. Not always. I have used this breast collar in the show ring, and I have, no one has ever said anything other than, oh, isn't that pretty? <laughs> so I don't think it's an issue. But I do often switch to this one for the show ring. It, it's also got rolled traces. And one of the things that we can look at when we're, all three of these have uh, buckle in traces which I think is, a, if you're harness shopping, is something that's worth looking for. Um, at the back, this one just has one, because it's a roll tray, so it just has one slot to go onto the single tree. Um, this one has two, this one has two, but that's not a lot of adjustment. So a lot of the starter harnesses are sewn in at the front here, so only, you can only adjust it every four inches where the next slot comes. Uh, when you have buckle in traces, you, have, you are able to switch the adjustment at the front and it makes them way more uh, adjustable, better to get them fit absolutely perfectly so that the horse is in draft, which means that he is pulling correctly with his breast collar. So yeah, buckling traces are definitely worth it. If it costs you a little bit more when you're ordering your harness, I think that's one of the, the ones that are really, really worth it. Let's put this one on him. Now, 
Uh, the other thing that's interesting about this, so this, this neck strap is quite wide because it sits, it sits over his neck. This one as well sits over his neck, and that's pretty common. Most carriage harnesses in the world at large sit like that. This one is, again, a very light harness, and it's got a tab to put it back to the water hook to hold this strap back to the water hook. I don't think it matters a great deal. It's personal preference. Usually the show harnesses are the ones that hook back to the, to the uh, water hook. And a water hook, if anyone doesn't know, that's this, this hook here where the, the check will also attach, and we'll talk about that as we get to it as well. So as we, we can put this on, we can either put it over his head, we can unbuckle it and put it around. Um, if you were being really correct, as far as uh, carriage driving enthusiasts, <laughs> um, traditional method, you would put it on upside down and then twist it around in the direction of his mane and set it on. Just like you would a uh, draft collar. Although our draft collars have a snap at the top that you open them and slide them on. So there are many options. We're not going to be able to cover anything, everything in one video. <laughs> so let's do this one as I think it's probably more likely you have a similar breast color to this one. I'm just going to put it over his head because I think that's just as easy. We're going to unsnap his lead rope. Back on. Oops, trying to be coordinated about it. You're a very good boy, Brock, when I'm not coordinated. And put it up over his neck. Um, before we are hooking up to the cart, I put the traces just over his back or under the, if we have to walk somewhere, I'll tuck them underneath his uh, back strap to keep everything in place. Or even through the back, the two straps of the back strap to keep everything in place. So this one right now, he is showing you his best side, which isn't the best side for this here. <laughs> Rocket, can we turn around? <laughs> so this brass color right now, I would say is a little high. Again, a little hard to see in his winter fur, but he needs his winter fur these days. It's a beautiful day today though. Tomorrow, not so much. So I think we can probably drop it a tiny bit. So the point of his shoulder is right there. We want to make sure that we're above that and the base of his neck is here. Now he is lucky he ties in quite high on his neck so we do have more space. Um, some horses won't and, and that's where shaped breast collar will really come in handy and make it easier for you to fit it to the horse comfortably. Um, I really think that the show harness people need to look at the shaped breast collar thing <laughs> because you could make it fine and shaped and it would um, make it so much easier for these horses to give you that big pretty front end movement while actually pulling the carriage from the breast collar as the harness is intended. So I think we'll drop this one hole maybe and we'll be happy. Now anything when you're adjusting a, a harness, we, we want it to be the same on both sides so that it's nice and even for him to be able to uh, pull everything he feels even more comfortable for the horse. Nothing gets all out of whack pulling side to side. The other thing to keep in mind if you ever do compete in a combined driving or pleasure show, uh, at the safety check they want to, you to have two holes or have at least one hole left on each pit of the harness. So if you're at the last hole to make it fit your horse, um, punch another hole in there because they want to have that other piece, that other hole available. So that if, if it broke, if you're in the last hole up here and that piece broke off, you've got nowhere to go. <laughs> so you can't, you can't fix it, get back in your, come here, get back in your cart and drive home, you're going to be stuck. So just something to keep in mind if that ever comes up for you. All right, I think that's all about the breast collar for now. We'll touch on it more as we come up to the cart. Let's move on to the bridle. So the bridle has a few less variations than the other pieces of the harness. Basically, it's gonna be a bit cheek pieces and a crown piece, a brow band and a nose band. We, um, this is my uh, starting bridle. It's an open bridle, and that's the word we use for one that doesn't have any blinkers. I start every horse in an open bridle, um, and until they are really comfortable doing everything that I'm going to ask them to do in a blinker bridle, I don't move out of it. I want them to know what's going on. So if anyone just, I just want to show you to show that whenever anyone says an open bridle, that's what they mean, is it doesn't have blinkers on it. If you're going to drive in the show ring, you do have to have blinker, a blinker bridle. It's in the rule book. Um, we want to talk a little bit about bits, I'm not going to get into it because that is a whole topic of its own. But we do want to make sure, this is just a mullen bit, I use this bit on almost every horse I drive. But um, we want to make sure that it doesn't have 
This is a snaffle mullein as well. We want to make sure that it doesn't pinch. That's what my primary concern. We want it to be the right size for the horse's mouth, the right width, which for most a size miniature horses, uh, three and a half to three and three quarters is going to be the right size. And, and this is a half cheek driving bit, which means that it's got a, the um, shaft on the bottom, but not on the top, which would be a full cheek, which is a riding, an English riding bit. Um, make sure it doesn't pinch. That's the primary concern. So if you just bought a, a harness off eBay and it came with a bit, that's the thing that I would check. Check the stitching <laughs> and check that the bit doesn't pinch because that's often those cheap bits too. This isn't an expensive bit. It was an $11 bit, but it doesn't pinch and it's comfortable for my horse. So that's all that really matters to me. And they're happy with it. Uh, we want to make sure that the blinkers have a wire stay in it when we're, when we're shopping for a harness to keep it out from their eyes. This, this piece has wire in it to be able to adjust it. Um, the other thing is we want to look at, if we're going to drive in the show ring, one of the rules in the show ring is that they do have to have a check. So let's talk a little bit about um, checks. Now this, this bridle has neither on right now, <laughs> but we can talk about how they would fit. An overcheck and how they function, which is probably the more important part. An overcheck goes from the bit up the center of the horse's face and through the, top, the crown piece of the bridle and back to the water hook. So what that does is that action pulls their nose up and out. The next, the, the side check, which is called in, in, um, in Europe originally was called a grass check because it was developed to keep the kids on the cute little Felwell ponies from having to jerk their horse's head up all the time from the grass. A, a side check, so this is the side check ring on this, harness, this bridle. It's so helpful, so helpful. The side check ring go, is here. So in the side check, the bit goes, the, the check goes from the side of the bit, there we go, from the side of the bit behind the cheek piece, out through the side check ring down the side of the horse's neck on both sides and back to the water hook. So that one only affects the horse's head and neck movement when they go to actually drop their head to the ground. I personally drive without a check as much as I possibly can. I don't think it's a necessary piece of equipment and I think that used incorrectly it can seriously hinder the horse's movement. I also do not believe that it is a tool of torture unless you use it that way. If you have to use a check, use a check. <laughs> Just make sure that you introduce it gradually and make sure that it isn't interfering with the horse's movement. Um, the purpose of an overcheck is one thing, and that is to hold the horse's head up. So just be really aware of that. And just because there is an overcheck on your on your starter harness <laughs> does not mean it needs to be there um, you, or that you need to use it. So if you're only driving in the field or at home, and you have no intention of ever driving in a show ring, get a pair of sharp scissors and cut that thing off because you don't need it. If you find that you can't keep them from grazing, which isn't, have never been an issue for me. I can all, you just ask them to move forward, just, just carry on, ask them to move forward every time they put their head down to graze and eventually they'll realize, okay, this isn't grazing time, it's fine. It's not, a, not usually a huge issue. If you find that it is a huge issue, then use a side check so that it only, it, it starts working when that head goes down to graze. In the show ring, we have a, it's a little bit different world. You are required to use a check, that's fine. Just be aware of how it functions and don't, don't um, hinder yourself by using the check incorrectly. Um, for instance, if you had an overcheck on this horse that was too tight, by pulling his head up, you're making him hollow his back. By hollowing his back, you're, you're making it impossible for him to use his hind end effectively. And that's where all those big engine muscles are. You need to be, he needs to be able to reach underneath himself with his hind legs in order to actually get that elevated pretty movement that we're looking for. So again, I'm not saying that it's the devil or anything, but it's all in how you use it. Just be aware of how it works and don't just put it on because someone said, oh, you should tighten this check. That would make a world of difference. <laughs> so just make it, make sure you think it through for your horse. This bridle also has a cavison. Most show bridles do. We want to make sure that we, we use a nose band, a cavison in the show ring. Um, a combined driving bridle would have a nose band that's attached to the bridle, just like an uh, English bridle would. And, and the benefit of having it actually attached to the bridle is that it keeps the, the blinkers in so they can't peek in between the cheek piece and, and see something scary. But uh, some horses really like bl uh, blinkers, some don't. It's really up to you unless you're driving in the show ring, in which case blinkers are mandatory. When we put a bridle on a horse, I have this really handy uh, halter.
culture here with the nose buckle, highly recommend them. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so what we can do is just unbuckle the nose buckle and the one around behind his ears, he still has it. So it's just like slipping the halter around his neck, only all we had to do was unbuckle one buckle. The other advantage is that we can just put it, we can buckle it right over top the bridle after we're done and still have a halter on him. We'll notice that I am putting the bridle on before we've even started talking about a cart. There's a really good reason for that. <laughs> it is in the most dangerous thing that you can do with your driving horse to put a, hook him up to the cart without the bridle on uh, and reins attached. I know a lot of people do it, particularly with miniature horses and get away with it, but if you get away with it with 99 times and on the 100th, a bee stings him in the process of slipping his bridle off and his halter on or vice versa while he's hooked to that cart and he gets away on you with absolutely no way for you to, to control him and, and get him safe again. So it is your job, I say this all the time, it is your job, your responsibility to keep your driving horse safe and uh, so it is a huge no-no <laughs> to hook your heavy horse hooked to the cart without a bridle on and the reins attached. In fact, at most carriage events, carriage driving events in the world at large, you would not only be disqualified, you'll be asked to leave the ground because you are <laughs> you're a danger, not just to your horse, but to everyone else's horse on the property. So I think that, and I've seen people, it, we're talking about the show ring, where are you going, Rock? People have been uh, um, eliminated from uh, versatility for taking the bridle off before the cart was attached. So it, it is a rule no matter where you are. And it, it's a rule for a very, very good reason. We need to keep our horses safe. It is our responsibility, and I take that very, very seriously. All right, Rocka, can we put this on? We could talk briefly about reins as well. These are rolled reins. We use them for uh, in the show ring. We can use all, there's all types of reins out there if you get to a carriage driving store. I have some that are, are rubber and grippy, are great for use in the rain. If you are not a fair weather driver like me. <laughs> Um, the other thing that these have that is good is that they're, they're brown on the part that, hold, that you hold in your hands. And again, if you're going to drive in a dressage test, uh, one of the traditions of carriage driving is that the reins are brown and your gloves are brown. So it's just, if that's a goal of yours in the future, and you're looking at two sets of reins and one has, one's brown and one isn't, <laughs> get the brown ones. <laughs> hey, Rock. <laughs> I see a lot of people that bridle their horses really awkwardly. So. I'm going to show you a way to do it that will hopefully make it a lot more comfortable for your horse and, and cause a lot fewer issues when you're bridling. So this, we're going to put the cabison on first. Now you can undo this, undo, undo the cabison. I oh, this has not been on his head, so I'm going to undo it. <laughs> this has been on Jamie's head. Not a big stallion head like you, hey? So what we're going to do is put it on like a halter, but we could slide it over his ears in the same method that I'm going to use. Of, on the bridle. Now the cabison should sit just like a halter about a finger below his cheekbones, which I swear are there underneath the fur somewhere. <laughs> so we don't want it down too low. We don't want it, we want to be able to fit two fingers in it. So we don't want it so tight that it's actually holding his mouth shut. Next, we'll put on the bridle. Now if, if I had a check on this bridle, it, it, I would put it forward so that it would be out of the way. I'm going to hold this side. The, the crown piece in my left hand and his chin in my right. I'm going to guide the finger the, it in with my fingers of this hand, put my thumb in his mouth to ask him to open it, lift with my left hand to quietly put it in his mouth. Now this is the part that I see people do awkwardly all the time. I'm going to, to get his ears in, I'm, not, I'm going to put his ear forward, bridle my whole hand. I'm going to put his ear forward, bridle my whole hand. I see so many people slide it over and then reach in and try to pull that ear out amidst all the fluffy forelock. <laughs> it, it, horses don't like that very much, understandably. So we want to make sure that we do it. Uh, this method makes it much happier uh, occasion for everyone involved. We're going to do up his throat latch. Again, his throat latch shouldn't be tight. You should be able to fit at least two fingers in it. If you have a horse that takes his bridle off, which is not uncommon, Instead of tightening the throat latch, there is a little piece of equipment called a gullet strap that you can do that attaches the nose band, bottom of the nose band, and the throat latch together. And that keeps it on his head without tightening it around his throat latch, which he needs to be able to flex and to be able to, you know, breathe. Breathing's important. Yes, it is. No. So anyway, there's 
the bridle. Now these reins we would put through the turrets and then we'll be ready to start talking about the cart.